for gifts to bring you all. Husky, thank you for the bits. <laughs> Appreciate ya. Um, we're just gonna jump right into real talks. <laughs> You're a sweetie, Kate. Um, yeah, so, love. I fell in love for the first time when I was 12 years old, which is a ter terrible thing to do when you're 12. Obviously, 12-year-old 12 Fieldy was very different from 27-year-old Fieldy. Uh, innocent, open, Helpless, supremely loving. When I was 18 or 19, I had um, a bunch of nude images of myself leaked to the internet in an attempt to humiliate me. And I was like, nice try, but the joke's on you because I'm hot and there's nothing obscene about my body and um, not embarrassed about anybody seeing it. But when I was 12, I was very modest, insecure. Um, the thought of someone seeing me naked was probably the most mortifying thing I could have imagined. But 12 years old is when I started to experience intense, constant sexual pressure that went, that went well into my adulthood. By which point, you know, I, I, I learned how to just tell people to fuck off and enforce my own boundaries. But um, it took a long time to learn how to do that. So, I had my first boyfriend when I was 12. He moved. Well, it was great. It was so blissful to have a boy want me to be his girlfriend. Because before that, you know, if I had a crush on a boy, they were visibly repulsed by it. Um, but this, this was the first time a boy liked me back, and it was the best. And we would go, we would meet at the mall and hold hands and talk and talk for hours and get to know each other. Everything about each other. Um, he, he moved very fast. I'm pretty sure he told me that he loved me right away. And I waited a a very long time, I think months, before I set it back, because I, I wanted to make sure that I really truly meant it before I said something like that. <laughs> he paralyzed. Um, yeah, it was a very nice, slow process of learning about each other, developing trust. The relationship that we had became like very consuming. He wanted all of my time, you know, which, which kind of felt good. It was sweet in a way. Um, but it got to be, it got to the point where I felt I would feel guilty if I did anything at any time that did not include him. He, if we couldn't be together, he wanted to be on the phone. Um, it made me feel bad if I wanted to do anything else. Even if I had like homework or something, we would just stay on the phone and not even talk. Uh, he wanted to stay on the phone when we fell asleep. Really, 
demanded all of my time and energy. And, uh, hey, what's up, Wolfgang? My, uh, I'd never had to enforce boundaries before. I didn't know how to do it. So, kind of had this, uh, gradual erosion of my ability to make personal time and space for myself. And um, my boundaries also eroded under constant sexual pressure. He wanted to know, you know, like, when am I, when am I gonna get to see you naked? When are we, when are we gonna do these boyfriend, girlfriend things? Um, you know, I had a very appropriate fear of sex for a child because I was a child. Um, sorry if this gets uncomfortable. I really am just jumping right in. <laughs> yep, 12, 12 going on 13. And it wasn't self-evident to me at this time in my life that I didn't have to do things that I was uncomfortable with. And it wasn't self-evident to me that someone who cared about me wouldn't force me into positions that made me uncomfortable. These were not things that I ever thought about. He was the same age. Yeah, I was a kid. Um, very, yeah, self-conscious, insecure. I didn't want anyone to see my body. I didn't want anyone to touch my body. I did. I was terrified of wieners. <laughs> Thanks, true heart. Um, no, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for that. But. I was in love. Um, we spent so much time getting to know each other and um, sharing everything with each other. And it was so important to me to do anything that I could to make him happy. And it felt very bad to deny my boyfriend something that he wanted so badly. Um, I came to see anything sexual, you know, showing, you know, I think it was, it was very, very slow, very, very slow. Like I remember the first time I agreed to let him see me without my shirt on, just me in my bra. It was just, and so on, then I put it back on and that was it. <laughs> um, and it progress little and little from there. But I came to see, to see this as almost like a reward for our growing trust and a natural progression and a part of what it meant to love somebody. So I, uh, you know, when you're in a relationship, it's, that's where it goes, right? Get to know each other, gain each other's trust. Sexual contact, question mark, question mark, question mark. So little by little, um, you know, I suppressed my discomfort, convinced myself that sex was something that you let people do to you when you love them. And when you love someone, you, you put their needs above your own, and you suck it up. So that was the beginning of me becoming sexually active while hating every single moment of it. Um, 
I I would uh, fake orgasms and feel so, so bad about it um, because I, I didn't want to lie. I've always felt very terrible about lying. But um, I didn't know. I didn't know how to... I wanted to like it, you know? I, I, I really wanted to. I wanted to be able to relax and enjoy it. So when I couldn't, I pretended to so that it could be over. And uh, oof, I think about... You ever hear men complain about uh, having sex with women who act like dead fish? Oh, that's uh, yeah. hey, Moiku. Thanks, thanks so much for the sub. Toe, you don't get a fieldy notification, baby ridge. <laughs> Hi, Moiku. Um, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. What's the last thing I said? <clears throat> Dead fish. Oh, god, yeah. Um, Oof, when I hear that, I just want to scream, like, your sexual partners haven't been lazy. They wish that wasn't happening to them, but I don't know. That might not be, might not be the case. Um, that was the sexual aspect of that relationship. Um, there was also... I think he felt he, he had this very intense want and need for my affection, my time, my body. Um, and I'm sure that he could feel that I didn't have that desire. I loved him. I did very much, um, more than I've loved anybody, honestly. Um, you know in a way you can only love as a little kid before you've been all traumatized and shit. But, um, I think it was very hard for him I don't even know what I'm trying to say. It doesn't matter what he felt because, um, he, we were, we dated for about three years. It was a very, it was a long, long draw. Um, he regularly tried to make me feel um, like he didn't love me. Um, if we didn't see each other for a while and I came over. Hey, Hello. hi. What's up, boo? Are you boiling water on purpose? I don't need the water boiling okay. anymore. <laughs> That's all. Awesome. I know you're streaming. Thank you. What do you mean, damn it, Witwicks? What did I do? I think they meant to say hi. <laughs> oh! That's a weird way to say that. Mm hmm Can we go away? No, I'm just talking. You're up in seriousness. <laughs> yeah. Ben from your stream, what do? I'm just, uh... I would try and complain in other chats. I'm just bursting into people's lives and making everyone uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's what we do. Oh, then I'm fitting right in here. You are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Showed up, made people uncomfortable. Talking about my shitty boyfriend who used to tell me he didn't love me. Oh, I thought you meant me. No, not you. <laughs> I was like, you're shitty boyfriend. <laughs> I really should get out of here. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's good. All this headwear in here. I do. And it gets cold in here. <laughs> You're doing so good. <laughs> I've never talked about this relationship before with my voice. Um, I am known on the internet. For being very outspoken and oversharing. Um, because it's uh it's even though there's a bigger audience, it's less personal than talking about it face to face with somebody. And I think these 
first romantic relationships I have have a lot to do with that. Um, <clears throat> Hey, Joseph, we met at Twitch. Well, we've known each other through Twitch events, but we started hanging out at the last TwitchCon. <laughs> Little, I know, he's <laughs> the fucking Kool-Aid man back there. He's like, are we getting sad up in this bitch? I'm here to help. No, but I was saying, um, I don't know. It was a very, this was such a long time ago. So I remember a lot more the general feelings that I had a lot more than I remember individual events. Um, but f for instance, um, I remember times like where maybe we hadn't seen each other for a couple of weeks and I would go over there and he would, he would say, wow, I didn't even miss you and like things like that. And um, I let that go because I knew it wasn't true. I knew how, how much, um, how much intense feeling he did have for me. So I was just like, yeah, okay, all right, he doesn't want me to know how, how much he actually does love me. Um, it took me a, a very long time, like years, to realize that the fact that he wanted to hurt me was much, much worse than any of the individual things that he did to try and do it, which were usually unsuccessful because he was kind of a dumbass. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, Lobos and I broke up over a year ago before our wedding. Uh, he was interested in being with someone else. Um, so yeah. Just trying to I'm trying just to give an overview of kind of what happened in this relationship without using any loaded terminology <laughs> um, but this was someone that I loved who repeatedly tried to hurt me with the things that he said and someone who pressured me daily into having experiences that I didn't want to have. Hey, Carl. And uh, when I would talk to him, about the ways that he hurt me, um, it was horrible, horrible, because he was a very sensitive boy he would start sobbing and crying in what seemed like very genuine regret. <laughs> hey, Zarene. And the result would be me comforting him for causing me pain and, you know, drying his tears and telling him he's not a bad person and I know he didn't mean it. When I told him about feeling unhappy, this was around when my, around the same time my depression started. Um, So when I, when I told him about being unhappy with my life, um, it would become like, why don't I make you happy? And again, um, I was constantly helping him process his pain while having no outlet for my own. And, um, the result of that was that I stopped trying. I started to feel that sharing my thoughts and my feelings with other people was not worth the struggle that came with it. Um, that 
being honest about how I felt was either going to be a fight or cause someone that I loved intense distress. And uh, that has stayed with me with every relationship that I've had. I don't want my pain to be painful to other people. Um, I told you that he uh, was very demanding with my time. Um, there was one time towards the final end of our relationship with, obviously, you could probably guess that we broke up and got back together a lot of times over those years. Um, <laughs> There was one time that I had had friends over and not invited him. When he found out, um, he broke up with me, which was a, a common way that he would, you know, get back at me for perceived slights. <laughs> um, he broke up with me and told me that he never loved me and that he had only wanted to be with me for sex. And then he posted a picture of my boobs on an online forum with the caption, we are trying to, <laughs> this was not funny at the time, but it's a little funny. We are trying to raise money to help this poor girl with her nipple cancer. <laughs> Um, uh, that was the most painful thing that I've ever experienced um, because I already feared that, you know, like I cared about him so much, and I couldn't put it into words, but I think I was starting to understand that he um, loved what he could get from me, but was not very concerned with my happiness. Um, but even still, um, it was impossible for a really long time to get out of that. Uh, tried to break up with him a lot of times. And he broke up with me a lot of times too, but it was different because when he broke up with me, it was to hurt me. He didn't, he didn't want to lose me. When I tried to break up with him, it was because I was so, so unhappy. Um, but when I tried to break up with him, it would always, um, I just really couldn't cope with the guilt, you know, because I did care about him a lot. And, um, you know, seeing someone cry and beg you not to go. Um, yeah, like, that's really hard. And uh, I was the person who comforts him when he's going through things like that. And it just seemed really wrong to not immediately turn around and try to make him feel better. That was, that, that was a long long process, but I did finally realize that um, didn't didn't really matter the intensity of his feeling, um, whatever love he thought he felt for me, because the love that I had for him and protecting him and making him happy and if he loved me too, then he wouldn't try to hurt me. That's, that's pretty simple, right? 
pretty simple, but at the time wasn't at all. Um, so that's that. That was my first experience with romantic love. <laughs> um, and yeah, to this day, um, finally breaking up with him is the, the hardest thing I ever did. And um, the most painful thing, like even more painful than my, uh, my fiance leaving me later. <laughs> um, just unimaginable guilt, you know, because I, I didn't stop loving him just because he was cruel. And it's very confusing to be that age and um, to understand that just because you love someone doesn't mean that you're going to have a happy life together. You know, it felt wrong. Like, if you love someone, you make it work no matter what. Um, so it took a long time to unravel that. <laughs> yeah. So that was my start. Um, and uh, yeah, I've never, never talked about that before because it's Very, like, it's embarrassing to still feel so affected by things that happened such a long time ago. And, um, I don't know. I always just felt like who. If you tell someone that you had a relationship when you're 13, 14, they're like, oh, that's cute, you know. Um, and of course, everyone, like, when they experience their first heartbreak, is devastated, but they get over it. So, yeah, um, just never really felt like I could expressed to someone else why that has like stayed with me for such a long time anyway i've been like <laughs> thinking so hard over the past like week like I've known, like, since I first decided that I was going to do, like, a little talk show like this, I was like, I'm probably going to talk about my first boyfriend, but, like, it took me a really long time to kind of, like, work through and, like, narrow down, like, what to say about it and how to frame it and why. I think a lot about, like, the point of talking to you guys and what it does for me and what it does for you guys. Um, when I was in college, I was a courier at night. So every night I would, I worked for a medical lab, so I would drive for hours through LA and pick up medical samples and bring them back. So I just had you know, hours and hours of just being in a car by myself. <laughs> the mirror's edge lady. I'm not sure which one <laughs> you're referring to. Was there one about a courier? Anyway. Um, yeah, every night I would have these hour-long drives. I usually listened to podcasts. <laughs> nice handwriting. I actually, like, I, when I journal, I write in like crazy cursive because I know that if anyone happens to read over my shoulder they'll have no idea what the fuck this says <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I was a courier and I would drive for hours every night. I usually would listen to podcasts, but sometimes if I forgot my iPod, I would just go through <laughs> yeah, my crypto cursive. I would, um, anyway, if I forgot my iPod, listen to the radio, you get tired very quickly of listening to the listening to music on the radio if you do it regularly for hours because you know it's very recycled um so i started listening to talk radio and um i stumbled on loveline which was a call-in show for relationship advice hosted at the time by celebrity doctor uh drew pinsky <laughs> yeah and um like, you know, at first I was just listening to it out of whatever curiosity. I'm like, at least all these fucked up people, like, this is going to be good. Um, but um, Dr. Drew was amazing and so helpful for me because um, he was the first person that I ever heard talk in a firm reasoned way about healthy and unhealthy relationships <laughs> and um it was the first time that i heard words like trauma and abuse attached to experiences that I could relate to. Um, and that was like my nightly therapy. Like, it was so cathartic. I would just listen to people talk and Dr. Drew like walk them through it and I would just like cry for hours and it took like a really big weight off of me. It was probably the closest thing that I've had to like successful therapy was was listening to Loveline. Because um I I felt like the person who had been abusive because I was the one who who left and broke his heart so terribly. Um, and I had so much guilt about my despair because I didn't know where it came from and um, I couldn't understand why I would have depression or feel sad because I have had, had a very good life, you know, I have a family that loves me, I'm, I've always been well cared for. Um, I, I loved someone and I was the one to break it off. Um, and I could never, even though I like knew that, holy shit, thank you for the bits <laughs> so much, Mr. Egg. Um, yeah, even though I could recognize that in a lot of ways he didn't treat me well, I've never been able to call him abusive like even now which is it's i don't understand it it's really weird because it's very easy for me to look at situations now and just be like abusive 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 dump his ass he sucks fuck him um <laughs> but i can't um because he was just a kid and it, like we didn't know what we were doing <laughs> Um, and, uh, I know that the sexual component of it, like, really fucked me up, but, um, you know, how could I, how could I call it sexual abuse when there, there's not an abuser, and, um, I went along with it and didn't struggle against it, you know? Like, that didn't make sense. And, uh, yeah, there are a lot of people who feel like they have no reason to complain. And that, yeah, that's, 
I'm definitely in that category as, um, you know, my life has been about as good as it can be. I'm pretty blessed. Um, but yeah, one night I heard uh, Dr. Drew describe a sexual relationship between adolescents as child on child sexual abuse. And like, at first I was like, Okay, you know, that seems kind of dramatic, but um, it also, again, just like kind of cracked me open and took a big weight off to have a way to describe that without putting blame on another kid, (laughs) Um, but to have some confirmation that it was harmful and like legitimate to have like to feel a lasting impact so um yeah (laughs) it's funny that you know a talk show like impacted me so much but it, it really did and um was the start of me understanding that um, there could be a purpose to um, opening up and talking about the things uh, that I would have otherwise treated with secrecy. (laughs) Um, Yeah, just throughout my adult life, um, becoming outspoken about mental health and uh, sexual consent and stuff. Um, I don't think I would have done those things if I didn't have the experience of seeing how helpful it can be for other people. Otherwise, I would just be um, talking about it for my own sake, and that seems very selfish. But listening to other people's stories has been so important to me for being able to put my own experiences in perspective. So, yeah. (laughs) And um, I wanted to just start off by telling about that relationship before I called it abusive. Um, Before I said anything about sexual abuse or trauma, um, because I still don't know how accurate it is to say that it was sexual abuse. Um, And um, yeah, part of the reason it's so hard for me to ever talk about it is because I. I know that it was painful for me, and I don't know if other people would understand why. And I don't know if they um, would agree with that description. Um, And I've mentioned publicly before, without going into any detail, that I have experience with sexual abuse, um, which is like hard to say, but important to. You should be able to say something like as simple and common as, you know, I was mistreated once without having such intense fear of backlash. Yeah. Um, And when I did talk about it, I I found that everything (laughs) that was scary to me about talking about it was totally valid. Um, mm, My brother told me I was seeking attention. I was worried people would think that. My dad told me that 
I needed to reel it in. You know, there are certain places, um, certain places to talk about these things, but not public. Um, my mom was really upset, which ties back into like my crippling fear of my pain being painful to people who care about me. Um, and it was horrible. <laughs> it sucked. And, you know, I've also wondered a lot if um, my intensity of expression in like 2016 especially contributed to my fiance pulling away from me. Um, but yeah, it's weird. For that, it's such a simple thing, but it, I like really completely like freeze and shut down when I try to talk about it. Yeah, and uh, like my, I have the best parents who like care about me so much, and um, everything they do is with my best interest in mind. So, um, I'm very lucky for that, but it's also been really hard for me to um, share my problems with them because they they want me to be happy, and it's hard to tell them that despite their best efforts, you know, that I have a lot of unhappiness in my life. Um, but yeah, um, it's hard to know that people will doubt your intentions. And uh, there's nothing nefarious <laughs> in me just sharing my experiences. You no know, part of it is is you know, for me to get some weight off my chest. Part of it is because sharing stories is important for everybody. It's helpful. Um, it's things that we should be talking about as a society. They're, um, but yeah, we don't, it's still very taboo to talk about emotional pain. Okay, <laughs> I'm going backwards through like, <laughs> I, okay, I, mean, I, I wanted to do, I wanted to do this stream yesterday. Um, I sat down in the morning just to do like a little outline, like one page of like what I wanted to talk about. Cause I, I uh, was really worried that I would just like sit down and be like, oh fuck, I don't know what to say. Um, but yeah, instead of writing an outline, I just wrote for like pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. And I was like, what, what the fuck do I actually say out of it? Like what needs to be said? This is just too fucking much. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh. That was the hard part, so I just didn't want to be, we not want to be anxious about it anymore, so I just started with that. Anyway, now <laughs> I can talk a little more philosophically and not about my personal experience. I got that out. <laughs> Susan, we're going to hug someday. So. I have been reading uh, Bell Hooks. Well, been reading. I finished reading Bell Hooks. I was reading her book, All About Love. Bell Hooks is a um, black feminist writer. She talks a lot about... Um, love and abuse. She talks, I think... A lot of people might associate her with toxic masculinity, and for that reason, I think a lot of people might not give her the time. Um, but I find all of her writing very 
compassionate and centering and insightful. Um, she's great. I highly recommend reading anything that she's written. Um, so I was reading her book all about love. And she starts off with one of the most controversial things that I think I've read about love. Um, and then she goes on to talk about how upset saying this has made people. Um, but what she says is love and abuse cannot coexist. And um, I was reading that and I was like, is that true? Because so many people experience abuse. And if you say that love and abuse can't coexist, you know, what about, I think it's like commonly accepted now that like spanking your kids is abuse. So are all parents who spank their kids, can you say they don't love their kids? You know, like how does that work? Um, what about people who are abusive but don't mean to be? What about people who think that they're doing what's best for others but are really being harmful? <laughs> um, I do, I do think that spanking is abuse. Um, we, it's something that only happens, that's only considered acceptable when it happens to kids, you know? Like, you can't spank an adult for acting out. Um, and I, the loving way to treat people is not causing them physical harm. You can teach them to behave without traumatizing them. But anyway, that's not the point. Um, just opens up a lot of questions, you know? Um, and I think her argument and kind of the uh, big theme going through the book is that love is as love does. So love in this definition is not how you feel. Um, love isn't intense feeling. It isn't how you feel about someone. Love is the way that you treat them. And um, this takes away so much of the confusion about intention. Uh, I could never consider that I had been abused because I couldn't consider the people involved to have been abusive. Um, because they, they didn't mean it. Uh, they didn't know that they were causing me lasting damage. Um, but it doesn't matter because they did and they weren't treating me lovingly. Um, so it's not true that they loved me just because they had intense feelings regarding me um, if they didn't treat me with love. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Thai books, totally. That's like, that was the first thing I was like, that seems like a very simple way to put a very complex thing. Like, how are you defining abuse? How are you saying, you know, but um, I think it would be really helpful for most people to internalize that, that 
love isn't love is not feeling love is doing love is what you do and how you act and people can think that they are being loving and they can be wrong um i think it is important to take the intention out of it because you can understand why someone mistreats you and you can also understand that it isn't right and it isn't loving and that you don't have to accept it how do you treat someone lovingly treating someone lovingly means wanting the best for them when you love somebody you want to act in ways that are consistent with them becoming their best self. And you don't do things that are harmful to them. And yeah, um, I think that was why it took me so long to leave bad relationships is because um, they felt so strongly for me that I could not accept that um, their behavior wasn't loving because of their emotional intensity. It was like, um, you know, with my, my first boyfriend who would intentionally make me cry and then start crying himself, um, when I saw him crying, like my feeling was, wow, he loves me so much that seeing him, that seeing me in pain causes him this pain. Um, and that was how I confused abusive behavior for loving behavior. <laughs> so yeah that was a whole lot about what love isn't wasn't it because i did have to figure that out a long while before i figured out um you know what love actually does look like so an actual loving relationship requires trust, honesty, affection, care, um, and just a genuine um, want for the other person to live a good life. Um, Two people who are in love should um, be comfortable expressing themselves, um, not hide from each other, um, and uh, bring out the best in each other. you want to realize your best self mutually <laughs> um you grow together in ways that are beneficial um and you set boundaries and respect those boundaries You guys agree <laughs> am i missing anything um yeah i think that's the biggest 
misconception about what love is um wanting things from somebody versus wanting things for somebody um wanting to get rewards from a person is not love um of course it's fine to want affection um, and when you love somebody you give each other affection um, but you don't want anything from them that they wouldn't also want you know for themselves um, I had a really hard time um, having relationships with anybody um, because I just, I really didn't think it was, I thought it was just way too stressful to try to tell people how I felt, so I couldn't connect with people. <laughs> um, you know, I internalized that what other people wanted to do with me and my body was more important than what I wanted to do. Um, so... Yeah. It <laughs> takes a lot of work to undo that. Love is giving oral sex without the intent to receive it. With the um you know. Yeah. <laughs> if if your partner definitely wants to be receiving oral sex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the heart of it, is just wanting the best for the other person. And um, it doesn't mean not also wanting the best for yourself. It's not a loving relationship if you're giving everything to make the other person happy and um, it's not mutual, you know? It comes from um, being able to know each other and uh, respect each other's wants and uh, work together to realize them. It is. It's very complicated, Thai books. Um, like, impossibly complicated. <laughs> um, which is why I'm so preoccupied with it, because I can spend 10 years thinking about it and still um, have questions and doubts. I'm super uncomfortable in my relationship. The only time I can feel like I can be open is talking to anyone who isn't my wife. Yeah, um, that's a really big problem. Um, I would recommend seeing a therapist, um, both individually and as a couple. And uh, it's still a problem that I have. Um, I can be very withholding in relationships, um, and it's not intentional. It's just uh, instinct. I keep things to myself. Um, I'm making, I have to make a very conscious effort to uh, kind of push past that and be frank about my feelings, even if I think it might be painful for the other person to hear. Um, but that's important, and that's part of trust, um, being able to speak honestly with the person you're in a relationship without being afraid that they will attack you or not care or um, like react badly if you don't have that um you don't have a loving trusting relationship you just don't
and yeah um yeah what what darkness is saying when you get into a relationship that frames everything going forward yeah he's saying you start to think to yourself so this is a relationship this is how things are supposed to be um i, I remembered something else that i wanted to talk about from bell hooks is um something that she wrote about that really like hit home for me um is how uh, the idea that someone important to us the idea of not being loved by someone is so painful that we will completely change our conception of what it means to be loved um instead of being able to say you this person isn't treating me with love we will say well you know love looks different people show love in different ways um we will we would rather accept mistreatment and call it love than admit that we are not loved yeah uh it is all about love by bell hooks i also highly recommend reading the will to change Yeah, Saki, that's rough. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. The looser, the looser the definition of love is, the easier it is to accept behavior that's not loving and call it love. So that's why, um, even though it might seem too black and white, these definitions of, of love being as love does and, and love being completely incompatible with abusive behavior, um, I think that tight definition is important. Otherwise, it's just too easy to, um, you know, be treated poorly and call it love. Yeah. <laughs> so I have quite a lot more to say on this topic, but um, not anything that I plan to say today or can currently think of. So if you all got any questions or want to chat, we can chat, but I'm done with the, uh, the scripted, loosely scripted part. <laughs> Um, I believe that we have a, a serious societal problem with lovelessness, um, and we don't have the language to understand it, so we don't, <laughs> and we just kind of accept it and tell ourselves that it's okay and normal and enough, even while feeling somewhere deep down that we are lacking something. Um, and this was something I was thinking about too. Why does it matter so much to me? Why 
do I keep thinking over and over and over again? Why, why do I struggle so much with labeling this? Why do I want to know if it was or wasn't actually abusive? Um, and when I just like write down just the bare facts of how I was treated, I think it's really obvious that it was abusive, but um, it's still really hard for me to call it that. Um, so yeah, I'm like, why does it matter? Like. I can look at what happened, um, confirm that it was harmful, and see the ways it affected me. Why do I need to have a name for it? Um, and the reason is that you can't heal from pain if you're in denial that there was ever pain. Um, the first thing we teach kids um, when they when they come. Oh to... <laughs> yeah! My headphones are so fucking loud. Hi, Carl. I love you very happy much. Happy baby day! What a perfect time for this happy <laughs> very moment. Very happy. Thank you, Carl. Eighteen months. You're you're, you're the fucking king. <laughs> I love you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. If you right, I was saying you can't. You can't heal from pain if you don't recognize it as pain. Um, and that causes a lot of confusion for people, especially me all the time. Because um, I feel like that shouldn't have been so painful. And so instead of um, finding healthy ways to, to cope with it, um, you just push it down and say, you know, stop being such a fucking baby about things that happened 10 years ago. Um, and then you just, it just stays there forever. And, uh, yeah, I was just starting to talk about how everything comes back. I always talk about kids, um, because I learned, I've learned a lot from working with kids. Um, but we start emotional education immediately, um with young kids because emotions are very scary and confusing if you don't know what they are. So we teach kids um, as soon as they start school, um, you know, flashcards with sad faces and happy faces. And um, this, is, this is what it means to be mad. This is what it means to be sad. This is what it <laughs> means to be happy. Um, because having words for feelings brings understanding. Um, and if you can identify what you're feeling, then you can identify uh, solutions for dealing with it. And you can say, this is what you're supposed to do if you feel sad. And th these are things you can do when you feel angry. Um, but those emotions obviously get a lot more complicated when you're an adult and there isn't any education on what to name it and how to deal with it. And um, I don't know what it is about the words abuse and trauma, but we are very unwilling to apply them to our experiences. Um, I've denied for so long that I have ever experienced trauma. That seems um, absurd, but it's not. You know, um, you don't have to have gone to war to have experienced trauma. Uh, you don't have to have been locked in a box and beaten. Emotional trauma just means that something happened to you that hurt. <laughs> um, and that's it. <laughs> and everyone experiences it. There is no person, no matter how lucky or... Um, hi, Super Lisa. There's no person in this world who will go their whole lives without experiencing trauma. 
but most people will not call their trauma trauma. Um, we're, we're all going to love someone. We're going to deal with death, betrayal. Um, being human hurts. And the common thing to do is just stuff that away and tell yourself it's, it's not really so bad. So, um, yeah, that's why I don't know. I didn't want to scare people away with using words, abuse and trauma, like in the title. I ended up doing it anyway, but, um, yeah, I think that is helpful to anyone who feels pain and can't really process why, um, and who feels like, well, nothing bad ever happened to me. Uh, you don't have to be a Vietnam vet to have trauma. Um, life will hurt sometimes, and if you're going to get over it, you have to acknowledge it. So yeah, I'm going to just restate that you can't heal from pain that you are insisting doesn't exist. You, it is very important to recognize. Yeah. Um, you have been through things that hurt. And it doesn't matter if you think it shouldn't have hurt so much, or if you think other people don't understand why it did hurt. Um, you don't control how you feel. You cannot control how you are affected by things. Um, but you do control how you deal with it. You can either stuff it away or, or take a look. Um, this happened, and it made me feel this way. And it changed my behavior. Um, what can I do to get back to a healthier mindset? And yeah, I... We'll have to do another stream about the cultural impact of emotional repression, which is rampant <laughs> um but yeah that's a whole nother talk <laughs> so yeah i think um i've been getting over it more and more but i definitely i feel like I am taking a risk, you know, when I talk about these personal things. <laughs> um, but I needed other people um, I needed to hear stories about other people working through their distress to be able to even like fathom being able to do it myself. And so, um, I have made the decision that, you know, people that I care about might see me as attention seeking or being inappropriately candid. Um, but I think it's the best thing, the most important thing that we can do. Uh, talk about 
scary emotional traumas and, um, you know, acknowledge them as painful and move forward. <laughs> so it's been helpful helpful for me um, to push past that anxiety and it, it it was very impossible for a long time I was a very closed off person um, which I don't know if people would believe about me because I, I don't hold back very much these days <laughs> um but yeah the more resistant i feel about talking about something the more i know that it's important for me to do it um there's some harmful and irrational fear there that needs to be examined Amazing how well it analogs with physical pain. I hurt my shoulder and it's, sh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, physical trauma. When you have a physical trauma, you have no choice but to treat it. Um, but it's very hard to recognize our emotional traumas as such. I'm really sorry to hear that, Mr. Uppity. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that you could like self-reflect and <laughs> thank you, Super Lisa. Um, yeah, it really it took a very long time to recover any kind of like health <laughs> relationship health um and i wish i could say that after i got out of that harmful relationship i didn't do anything like that again but um yeah the boyfriend i had after that was uh, you know that relationship had a lot of the same characteristics um, of uh, someone who did not respect my boundaries and, um, you know, that I couldn't be open with. No, not Lewis. <laughs> um, no. Uh, actually, you guys. I'm out of things to talk about. Do you guys want to hear about my second boyfriend? <laughs> so the yeah the um second relationship that I had that um it's still hard to use the word abusive. I don't know. It's it was unhealthy for me. Um, and it was with someone who wanted things from me that I didn't want to give. Um, and it didn't matter. Um, so this is just burning red flags right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Zero. I know I'm like... I'm, I'm intense. I meant to talk about this like a month ago, but like um, after I talked about my most recent breakup, like I was just like, this is too intense. I need to give myself and everyone else a break. Um, all right. So my boyfriend that I had next first contacted me because he had seen the 
nude picture that my previous boyfriend had posted with the intention to humiliate me, which was very successful. And I was absolutely mortified to get this message. Um, it's like, I saw what your ex did and um, he offered to beat him up for me. But um, obviously I didn't want that. I was just like, oh my God, like so embarrassed that uh, this guy, he was a couple years older than I was, that he had seen my picture. Like I was just like horrified. Um, and I was just like, no thanks. Like, please don't talk to me again. Um, so the fact that he didn't leave me alone should have been like, bloop, 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 bloop. Uh, but it wasn't because <laughs> I still hadn't processed my issues. Um, and, you know, I knew that my last relationship was painful, but not so much why. Um, so he started, we started talking. Um, I hated it. I was so uncomfortable. I like didn't want. I didn't want to know that anyone had seen that picture. Um, and then I don't really remember much about like development of us starting to talk more. But at some point he asked me out and I said no. Um, and he just kept asking and asking and asking and, um, you know, like, why won't you just give me a chance? What's the worst thing that could happen? Just give me a chance. Um, I just had no ability to say no to people, like, when I was younger. Um, like, yeah, until I was about, like, 19. Um, I, I didn't want to date him, so why did I agree to date him? I, I gave in. I was like, like, our relationship started with me saying, okay, I guess we can go out. Um, he insisted, so I just went with it. I actually, like, <laughs> I made a little, like, bullet list because I was just like I'm just feeling so crazy like am I misremembering this like did I do cruel things that I don't remember was this really as bad as like I remember it being but yeah if you ever encounter someone who won't take no for an answer it doesn't really matter what it is get the fuck away from them they're no good <laughs> um but yeah, he wouldn't take no for an answer and I wasn't someone who knew how to say no. So we started dating. Um, so that is a, a good overarching theme of my initial experiences with romance is just being worn down until I would give in to what they wanted. <laughs> hey, Tupac. Um, I mean, there were, were things that made me feel good. Um, he was a very intelligent person, and it meant a lot to me at the time that he thought that I was smart. Um, so I did like that a lot. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends at this time. Um, the friends that I did have were just kind of like drinking buddies. Um, I didn't really have people that I related with deeply that I could like really talk about the things that interested me with. So I really did like having this um, 
older, um, intelligent guy who was interested in me and believed in my intellectual abilities. And um, we would talk a lot about politics and things, and I didn't really, I hadn't really ever had anyone else to talk about those things with. Um, so that was kind of my justification for staying there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was similar in a lot of ways. This was someone who wanted a lot of control over me. Um, he didn't approve of my friends. Um, he was very anti drinking and stuff. And I, I was a teenager. I shouldn't have been drinking, um, and doing drugs and everything, but I was, um, I did genuinely have like a substance abuse problem at that time. So, um, him being ultra controlling of who I hung out with and what I was doing seemed okay because it seemed like he had my interests um, at heart, but it was really excessive. Um, like to the point if I had like a beer with my dad, he would be like furious with me. Um, he was just like a really unpleasant person. He couldn't tolerate difference of opinion. Um, so what started off as like a good thing, like having someone to talk about politics and, and things like that with, um, became like really exhausting. Like we couldn't have, we couldn't agree to disagree on things. Like he would persist and persist and persist until I um, just gave in and like told him that he was correct. <laughs> um, he was really argumentative um, in ways that I didn't expect. Um, he was really like, <laughs> It's so, it's just crazy to like look back and, and like look back. It's like so obvious that this wasn't okay, but like, yeah, I don't know like why I went along with like all this shit. <laughs> um, like, why would I? stay in a relationship like where I was just constantly being attacked um, and like not feeling a connection it's just crazy um, yeah like I remember I told him I was like I'm gonna stop smoking cigarettes I smoke cigarettes that's I was like 16 because I was a, a dumbass um, but you know I briefly smoked cigarettes. Um, I told him I was going to stop, but, um, one day I had one and then I came to visit him at work and I was like, Oh yeah. Like I had a cigarette today. Like just, I don't know. Um, <laughs> All right. Saki, thank you so much for subscribing. Welcome. Um, and he got so mad. Um, he was just instantly like, you told me you weren't going to do that anymore. And I was like, like, yeah, for my sake, like that wasn't a promise I made to you. That was a promise I made to me. And like, I was just, yeah, like there were so many things that turned into like immediate fights where I was just like, why, what, <laughs> like what's happening? Um, I had a, I had like a really bad falling out with some of my friends one time and uh, I went and spent some time with a friend and we had a beer together and we're talking and then I hung out with my boyfriend after. I went to his house crying because I was like, you know, distressed and um, just started telling him like what a bad night it was and I was like, yeah, I had a beer. And um, he was so mad. I'm like, how could you do that? Like, 
so mad that I had had a beer when he had decided that I was not to have a beer. Um, and I just like completely shut down and that started to become like a normal thing or I would just like freeze up and just not be able to talk. Um, like not even have things that I wanted to say, but not be able to say them, but just like not even have any thoughts at all. Like I would just freeze and like, <laughs> um, and then he would yell at me for not saying anything. And I would just be like sitting there like, say something, say something, say something. But you can't say anything when the only thoughts in your head are like, oh my God, why can't I think of anything to say? Um, so yeah, between just all those little moments added together of like him picking fights for no reason or um, yelling at me while I'm crying. <laughs> um, not tolerating me having opinions that didn't align with his. Um, was just a, another tick for uh, becoming a person who just doesn't share how I feel because it's just not worth it. Um, and yeah, this is in the past. I dated him from like age 16 to 18. And then when I broke up with him, I was like, I'm, I'm gonna be alone for the rest of my life by choice. I will get some cats. I never, never want someone to love me again because it's exhausting. <laughs> um. Yeah, <laughs> that was where I, that was where I was at entering my adult life. Um, that if I wanted to be in a relationship, um, it would involve me constantly being worn down and um, involve heavy self erasure. I didn't even mention <laughs> anything about like sex with him, but that was also the same. Like I didn't enjoy having sex with him, um, but I still was just of the mindset that it's what you let <laughs> Like, it took me a really long time to understand that it was important for me to enjoy sex. Like, I just saw it as something that you do, you let someone do to you to um, progress your relationship into, you know, you care about someone, you let them do that. Um, and I have a much easier time, like, I don't feel any anger towards my first boyfriend, even though he, like, fucked me up way worse, but I do feel a lot of anger for my second one, because he was older than I was, and, um, a lot more evidently, um, callous, <laughs> to what I wanted. Um, like, there were so many times where I didn't want to have sex and he insisted that we have sex. Um, and that I just would because I thought I was supposed to. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, it wasn't until you know, a lot later, listening to Loveline and Dr. Drew um, talking about boundaries and consent, that I was like, 
that's so fucked up. Like, I can't, I can't imagine, like, the person that I was having a sexual relationship with not wanting it and knowing that they weren't into it or, like, knowing that they were uncomfortable and then proceeding, like... I would be so disgusted with myself, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, if someone else told the same story, I'd be like, yo, he's a raper, like, fuck that. But um, it's still, it's just really hard to characterize it that way. Um, Yeah, like I can phrase it as like questionable consent, but uh, I didn't, I didn't resist. <laughs> yeah, and like it was legally statutory rape, but like the age difference isn't the problem. <laughs> it was that I didn't want to do it, um, and that he didn't care. And yeah, Lisa, I know that. <laughs> I know that, but Teenage Fieldy did not know that. <laughs> um, yeah, we got, I remember um, there was a night that we got in a fight. Um, see, the fights came down to him demanding I not do things that I wanted to do. And um, then I would admit to doing them. And it would be this huge fight. And I would feel terrible because, like, I wanted to be honest. So I would, like, tell him if I, like, did something, you know, like, have a beer. Um, but we got in this really big fight and I was just like, so upset and I was just like crying and crying and like thinking like, I'm always the one who does everything wrong and he never does anything wrong. Like he's perfect, which is like ridiculous. Um, but the reason it felt that way is cause like he never had to apologize because I didn't make unreasonable demands of him. Um, and then we went to sleep together and like this is a memory that i like hold on to when i am wondering whether or not i should hate him um like i was still crying as we were going to sleep and he wanted to have sex and i was like told him i didn't want to and then like he insisted so um like I got on top of him. Um, I don't know. I just th thought I was supposed to. Like, I thought that's what you're supposed to do when you're someone's girlfriend. Um, and I was still crying the whole time and could see my tears falling on his face. So I know that he felt them and knew I was crying. And, uh, that didn't have any impact on his sexual gratification. Um, so. Pretty gross. <laughs> Yeah, so when I left that relationship, I was really just, uh, I was just like, wow, being in relationships is, like, horrible, and I never want to do it again. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a dress. Yeah, and then, uh. Yeah, he ended up 
getting engaged to this like Korean girl and I uh, you know I don't keep up with his life anymore so I don't I assume that they ended up getting married um, but I just remember like the girl that he was with um, like all of her family lived in Korea and I knew that she was here and I was just like I was like, should I like talk to her? Like, I'm like, that's crazy. We've been broken up for a long time. That'd be fucking crazy to reach out to my ex-boyfriend's fiance. But I just, uh, know how like isolated she must be not having her family here and being with someone that I know to be so controlling. Um, and I worried a lot that he picked her because she's probably pretty um, easy to manipulate. But yeah, he sucks. <laughs> so, um, My relationship, fuck, I, okay, I have to pee really bad, but I, I have thought of more things to say. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to pee. It's been almost two hours. But, uh, yeah, quick break. Hate is a strong word. <laughs> 